Hello, my name is Mike Tolte. I work for Microsoft in the UK and this is one of a number of short tutorials on the ActiveTouch site about Silverlight 4, a Microsoft uh, RIA technology. And what we're going to look at here is just the basics of packaging uh, Silverlight applications. So we'll kind of look at what makes up a Silverlight application, how we use libraries, how we put resources into an application and so on, just so you get the idea of structuring the whole thing. Now, if you've not looked at Silverlight at all, there is an introductory tutorial on the ActiveTouch site. So if you just go to http bit.ly slash intro, then there's an intro tutorial there. And also I'm going to be using some tooling here. I'm going to be using Visual Studio. So if you don't have that already, you can get a copy of Visual Studio. There's a free edition, the Express edition. And you can use Visual Studio to do your Silverlight development. To get that, go to http bit.ly slash vs web express and the only thing you'd need to um, add to that is some Silverlight 4 tooling for this particular tutorial anyway and so what you do to get that is go to http bit.ly slash Silverlight 4 tools so if you've got this and you've got this then you're ready to begin this particular tutorial and poke around the packaging of a Silverlight application if you want to get in touch with me, then you can find me in a number of different places. You can find me at httpmtolty.com, which is my website. You can find me at mtolty.microsoft.com, which is my email address. And you can find me at Twitter, at mtolty. So if you want to get hold of me after the video, feel free to get in touch and uh, tell me what you think. Let's go and take a look at packaging up a Silverlight application. Okay, so let's close down uh, Notepad here and let's run up Visual Studio. I'm using the Ultimate Edition of Visual Studio, but your experience should be the same, really, whether you're using this or one of the free versions or one of the intermediate versions. There's lots of different versions out there of Visual Studio. Okay, so I want to create a really simple Silverlight application. And in Visual Studio, the way I would do that is by using File, New Project, File, New Project. That raises a dialogue for all different kinds of projects. What I want is I'm going to use the Visual C Sharp language. I could also use the Visual Basic language. I want a Silverlight project and I'm going to choose a Silverlight application. That's about the simplest thing I can do. I'm going to call it a Tutorial Tutorial Application. And when I click OK here, Visual Studio is going to pop up a dialog. And the reason why it does this is that generally speaking, Silverlight applications are served from a website. So usually what you have is a piece of HTML that points to the Silverlight application and both of those things are served from a website. So when I click OK here, Visual Studio is going to say, would you like me to make a little website for you because you really need somewhere to host your Silverlight application as you can see here. So I'm going to say, OK, look, yes, you can create a little website for me. I'm going to go with a website here rather than a web project because it's just slightly simpler in Visual Studio. And I want Silverlight version 4, not version 3. So when we create that inside of Visual Studio, what it actually does is it creates two projects within a solution and kind of links them together. I'll show you that in one second. So what it does um, is it creates the actual Silverlight project, which is this thing here called Tutorial Application. And it then creates, let's just let it finish doing what it's doing. So it creates this Tutorial Application and it then creates a website and what that website will do is host the Silverlight application. So if we just close down our windows over here for a second, if we go to the website and just right mouse to get its property pages, which are off this dialog, and go to property pages here, there's a, an area called Silverlight applications, and here we have our application. And what this is really saying is that Visual Studio will copy the outputs of this application into this folder called Client Bin whenever I build. Uh, we could change that um, actually but we won't do that in this particular case. Um, so it's a very simple idea really is that whenever we build the Silverlight application Visual Studio will kind of copy the outputs into this um, web application up here. And in fact if we just build straight away, so if you just go to the build menu and do build to build the whole solution, what we should see immediately is that Visual Studio has built this application it builds it up into a file format called a zap format, which is just a zip file. And it's dropped that zap file right here on the website. So let's just do something really, really simple. Let's go to the main page of our Silverlight application. Just double click that here. And we'll switch into the design view for it. And on the design view here, let's just go and take 
sort of the canonical button. We'll drag out a button here. We'll just change its properties. Let's just go to its properties over here. We'll find its content and we'll change that content to say click. So a button that says click. And let's just go to the code behind that which we can just do by double clicking on it and do something very very simple where we'll just say message box dot show oops not dot sow dot show and we'll say um, you clicked that kind of thing so very very simple and let's build that up and we'll then press F5 or um, start debugging in Visual Studio so just press F5 to do that Visual Studio asks us a few questions about switching on debugging, but that's kind of fine. And by the way, Visual Studio is here hosting this on a little local web server. Uh, you can see it's coming off a local host um, magically generated port number there. So here's our Silverlight application. It's not taking over the whole of the browser. We could easily fix that. Uh, and then we go and click on the button and we get a message box. So very, very simple. So what actually goes on when we do that? What have we actually generated and how does that stuff end up on the screen? Well, the first thing I'll say is if we go back to our solution here, um, the solution actually starts with this ASP.NET page here, this, this ASPX page. But there's no link between Silverlight and ASP.NET, so there's no reason for having this page at all. And what I'm going to do is just hit the delete key and remove that page. Because I find it simpler to start with an HTML page, and I'm going to just set this HTML page as the start page for my application. So that now when I press F5 inside of Visual Studio, it's going to jump to the HTML page, not the ASPX page. It's going to do exactly the same thing, but it's jumping to the HTML page. So let's go and take a look at that HTML page inside of Visual Studio. So let's just open that up. And let me just move this Solution Explorer out of the way. And perhaps I'll just full screen Visual Studio just so that you get a slightly better view of it. So if you take a look in this HTML file, you'll see that what we've got somewhere in here is a div hosting an object tag. And if we take a look at the object tag, you can see that what it's doing is it's requesting Silverlight. It's actually using a Silverlight 2 tag in there. And most importantly, it's passing a bunch of parameters to that Silverlight plugin. So this is how the plugin gets instantiated. By the way, if the user doesn't have the plugin, what they will see is this little piece of HTML here because that's just kind of the way that object tags work. So you'd see this little piece of HTML here, which is obviously customizable for yourselves. You can do whatever you want in that piece of HTML. But by default, it just has a couple of links to point the user to go and get Silverlight. So if they've got Silverlight, this object tag will spin up that plugin and it will pass it the most important parameter, which is the source of the application, which in our case is client bin tutorial application zap which is the file I kind of showed you um, previously. It's this file over here, um, tutorialapplication.zap. So what's actually going on inside of that zap file that we've got there? Well, let's just go to that client bin folder. and I'll open it up in Windows Explorer. Let's just go and find that. Let me do a quick copy on this file. So just copy and paste it. And we'll rename this just to make it into a zip file rather than a zap file. Because at the end of the day, all the zap file is, is a zip file. So if you just poke into the zip file a little bit, what you'll see is there's two things in here. There's the actual code. Uh, this is a .NET assembly. It has a DLL extension. It doesn't mean that that's a traditional Windows DLL. It kind of uh, isn't really. But this contains the .NET um, code for our application. And then we have this little manifest file that describes the application. So if we just um, go and drag that to something like Notepad. Let me see if I can just get that into Notepad. Oh, and the answer is no, because I haven't extracted it. Let's go back up one. Let's just extract all those files. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And let's pop into those things now. And let me take that thing and just open that up with Notepad. Okay. So what you'll see in here is just a little description of our application. It's a little XML file that says we've got an application. And it has one part to it. And the part is the little assembly file I just showed you. So the application is packaged into one lump of code, basically. And you'll notice that it says at the top here, not, not very well formatted, so let me just hack it for a second so that you can see it. Uh, yeah, da, da. Okay, so it says on this deployment that we have an entry point assembly, which is this one here. So this is telling the system 
which of the assemblies is the one to look in in order to get the application started and on the screen. And then it says there's an entry point type which is called tutorialapplication.app. So you can see how this links through to the code that we wrote. Um, let's see how it links through to this little type here. So let me close this back down and I don't need to save it. So that's the manifest file that we see there. If I just close down some windows again in Visual Studio, and let me just pop over to um, my Solution Explorer. And so when we look at our Silverlight application here, you'll notice that Visual Studio generated for us two XAML-based files, and one of them is called app.xaml. Now, I won't really get into the role of app.xaml here, but what I really want to say about it, if we just take a quick look, this is not about UI, this is sort of the, the heart of our application structure. And you'll notice that this application file produces a class called tutorialapplication.app. And if you look at the code that goes with this file, you'll see that what we're producing is a class called tutorialapplication.app. And so that um, XAML-based um, manifest that we see in the zip file points to this class here. And this class basically provides the startup handling and the exit handling for our application. And so that's how that XAML manifest links to here. So what the Silverlight system can do is it grabs the zip file, it opens the manifest, it finds the entry point, it knows which assembly that's in, and that allows it to find this class here and start the application. You might also notice that when the application starts, we set a thing called the root visual, the root visual, which is kind of as the name describes, the main thing on the screen, and we create an instance of this main page class. And that's the only other class in our project, is this thing over here, which we were designing a second ago, which is just a control with a grid with a button on it. And that's how our button ends up on the screen, basically. We have an HTML page with an object tag. That points to the zap file. The zap file has a manifest. The manifest points to the app. The app loads up the main page. The main page ends up on the screen. That's kind of the chain of events that happens to get a Silverlight application on the screen. What that means, of course, is that the only thing you need to deploy, really, for a Silverlight application is this HTML file, or one that looks like it, and this zap file. That's all you need. And you can put those onto any web server you like, as long as they will serve a, a zap file, then, then you're fine. There's no sort of Microsoft server-side specific stuff to this. Now, of course, it's possible for a Silverlight application to interact with server-side resources. It can make uh, web service calls and so on. We won't go into that really here. But another aspect of packaging your application is that typically not all your code is going to live in a, a single project like this. this. This kind of represents our main project for Silverlight in that it puts things on the screen. But often you want to partition your code off into reusable libraries and so on. And of course you can do that here. So if we go back to our solution for a moment, let's just go to our solution here and let's add a new project. And we can add a Silverlight class library. So let's just call this tutorial class library. And so this is just going to be a, you know, a library of routines that we can call. So if we just go in and put that in there, we want to use Silverlight 4. Then we could have some class. Let's just call this uh, my class, something like that. And let's just let that rename. And so now we've got this class library, my class. And let's just add a quick method to this. Let's just say public void show message. So we'll write our own message function. We'll take a message. And all we'll do inside that function, excuse the braces there, is um, we'll say message box dot show on that message. So all we've done is kind of rebuilt the message box functionality to no real purpose. But um, we can now use my class over in our tutorial application. All we have to do is add a reference. And Visual Studio makes this easy by giving you projects. And by the way, once you're in this dialog, these are all the other libraries that are out there for Silverlight um, just installed by default. But what we want is our own project here, the class library. We add a reference to that. You can see it now shows up in the list of references for my application. And so that means that the code that we wrote before, we could, if we wanted to, replace it by creating um, a new instance of my class. Visual Studio here has a trick for just fixing that um, namespace problem that we've got because we haven't brought in the right namespace. Let me just see if I can bring in the right using declaration up here at the top of the file just to bring in the namespace. We just say my class or my object, my my message box, whatever you want to call it. Create a new one of those and then we'll just say 
that what we want to do is say my message dot show uh, hello world whatever whatever we want and so basically what we've just done now is built an application out of two projects with two kind of packages of code in it we've got the library and then we've got the tutorial application of course running it should do exactly what it did before you know we're not I'm um, doing anything particularly clever there but if we went and took a look at the actual packaging of that let's just go back to my solution explorer here and let's just go and uh, have a look into the um, client bin folder up here again open that up in Windows Explorer I'll get rid of my previous copies let's copy this again let's paste it again let's extract everything from it let's just rename it as a zip first let's extract everything from it again and let's take a look inside there what we should see in this manifest this time well firstly we can see two things we have two assemblies packaged with our application. You can see we've got the tutorial application, the tutorial class library. And if you look in our manifest, you'll notice that it says this application is now consisting of two parts, tutorial application and tutorial class library. But the entry point is still inside of tutorial application with that class that we looked at earlier on. So hopefully that lets you see how um, easy it is. Let me just get rid of those two files again. How easy it is to split these things up into separate libraries. And then, of course, there's the possibility of reusing this library across multiple Silverlight applications. That's you know just the general idea of reuse. Okay, so the other aspect of packaging I want to touch on here is around packaging things like resources. So probably the simplest way of showing this is let's go back to our main page.xaml over here. And instead of having a button, let's just have an image. So we'll just have an image, and we'll just say stretch equals uh, fill on that image. Put that into our grid. Now we want to set the source for our image. And on my desktop here, let's just switch to my desktop. I've got this file called cat.jpg. If you just double click that, there's the cat, as you can see. And then I've got a folder that's called not cat, very binary. And in there we've got another cat.jpg, which is clearly a frog rather than a cat. So we've got two files called cat.jpg. So let me just go back to my project and what I'll do is take this cat.jpg and we'll just drag it over here and I'm going to drop it into this client bin folder. So there we have cat.jpg and let's set the source on this image to be cat.jpg. Okay and let's just run that up and see what happens. Okay and there is the cat. So what we've just proven there is that for something like an image, and in some cases an image is a bit of a special case, but for something like an image, let's just go back to that, for something like an image, if we have our image file on the site of origin, i.e. on the web server, then this image is prepared to load that from the web server. So it's prepared to load that from the web server. Now, let's take a look at a different example. Let's go to our actual application here. So not the class library, the application, the Silverlight application. And what I want to do is drag another image onto that. So let me go back to my desktop. I'm going to go to the picture of the frog, which is actually called cat. I know that's confusing, but it's kind of relevant. Let's take that and drag it over to Visual Studio. I'm going to drop it into the application. Uh, we'll just close that window down. I don't care about that. Let me just go back. And on the application there, let me just make sure that's uh, refreshed to show that it's in there. Oh, I don't seem to have dragged and dropped that properly. Let me have another go at that because I don't know where it went. Let's go back over here and drag it onto the application. There it is, cat.jpg. No idea what happened there. Now, very importantly, I'm going to go to the properties on this thing. And I'm going to set it as content. And I'll show you what that does in a second. But with that set as content, let's press F5. And notice we still get the picture of the cat. So cat.jpg is still referring to, to this file here. Okay. Instead of cat.jpg, let's try slash cat.jpg. Let's press F5. and we get the picture of the frog. So what's actually happening here, when we set this in our Solution Explorer and we set its property type to be content, 
what actually happens if we take a look at it is if we just go out to the zap location again let's go and open this in Windows Explorer do the same trick we've been doing all along there's the one that's on our website effectively here's the zap file let's copy that let's paste it let's rename it to make it a zip file uh -huh. and then let's just explore actually we can just wander into it notice that here I don't know if we can get the thumbnail to refresh or not, but in here we have another cat.jpg. This is the one that looks like a frog. And so essentially when we're setting content type, what we're saying is we actually want the content embedded inside of the zap file. So this has actually ended up in the zap file. And so over here once again setting the property on this to say content means put it into the zap file and that's what's happened and when we're using this slash syntax here that says I prefer the version from the zap file and so that's why we loaded up the frog and not the actual cat this syntax is kind of useful though in another way because if there is no file in the zap file so for instance if we go to this JPEG here and delete it it's no longer in the zap file. Press F5, what will this do? It falls back to the one on the website. So using this preceding slash like this says, use the one from the zap file if there is one, and if not, have a look on the website, and if not, then obviously we fail to load the image. Now, there's one more aspect to this. Let's go back and put our... Uh, frog image back in this application again so let's go back to our desktop let's find the thing that's not a cat but is called cat and let's take it back over to Visual Studio and drop it onto this tutorial application again now previously when we put this in here we set its property type to be content but there's two legitimate values for this action here one is content and one is resource now if we go and build as resource let's just build I won't run this just yet. Let's go and take a look in this bin folder again. So we're just going to open that up in Windows Explorer. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to just paste it. We're just going to rename it to be a zip file so that I can poke into it. And we pop in there. You won't actually see the JPEG file in there at all. What resource means is the JPEG file actually gets embedded into this assembly itself. So it becomes a resource inside the assembly as opposed to a resource inside the zap file. So how can we refer to that? Well, the first thing to show is that with this syntax, slash cat.jpg, if we press F5 on this and run it, we won't pick up the frog picture, we're picking up the cat. Now there is a kind of shortcut here where if we did take the leading slash off, and press F5 again with just cat.jpg, it will find that resource. I'd have to say that I don't recommend this shortcut. There is a longer syntax which generally saves your life, so I, I wouldn't do this. What I would do is use the full syntax. The full syntax is a little bit long-winded. You use slash, and then you use your assembly name, which in our case is tutorial application, so tutorial application, and then a semicolon, and then the word component, slash so this bit here is actually sort of always there we're saying it's inside this assembly it's a resource called cat.jpg I think if we press F5 on that then we should be back to showing our picture of a frog now why is that a useful syntax well imagine that I wanted to build this resource here into my other library so let's take the cat.jpg and cut it from here and paste it into here. So it now lives inside of my class library. Let's just make sure that its properties say that it is still a resource. Okay. So what we're basically saying there is that we've moved it into the other assembly. Now, how on earth could I refer to that from this assembly here? Well, I can do it by just saying tutorial class library and hopefully press F5 and we should see that on the rebuild and the rerun we're picking up that picture of the frog. Um, hopefully it's fairly obvious as to why 
it's important to be able to package resources with libraries. You know, you might have libraries of controls that rely on particular images, and you want to package those images with the code that relies on them, rather than um, hoping that somebody will build them into your Zap for you, or hoping that somebody will deploy them onto the um, the site of origin for you. So, packaging uh, resources with the code that operates on them like this is, is a really useful thing to do. The only other thing I'd say is, of course, that that kind of ties them together quite tightly. And also it increases the size of your libraries. So obviously the more resources you add into a library, then the bigger that library is going to be. So I hope that in this short tutorial you've got an idea as to how a Silverlight application comes together. We have an HTML page with an object tag. Object tag points at a zap file. A zap file is just a zip file. You can serve these off any web server you like. Inside of the zip file is a manifest to describe the pieces and some code. And those, that code is packaged into assemblies. There can also be resources inside of the zap file as we showed. You can set things as content and then they'll show up inside of the zap file as a way of referring to them. And you can also go and um, build resources as well into assemblies themselves and there's a way of referring to uh, resources inside of those assemblies if you do things that way as well. The one thing I haven't shown here is dynamically loading things. You can write code of course to load images and videos and so on at runtime and you can also write code that loads zap files at runtime but I've not really gone into that here. I'll leave that for a more advanced tutorial.